According to a report from the Daily Wire, Supreme Court Justice Sonia Sotomayor declined to recuse herself from multiple copyright infringement cases involving book publisher Penguin Random House, despite having been paid millions by the firm for her books. The high court declined to take up appeals, one in 2013 and in 2019, in two separate copyright infringement cases concerning Penguin Random House, Sotomayor did not recuse herself from these cases. This despite receiving a $1.2 million book advance from the publishing house in 2010 and more advance payments totaling $1.9 million in 2012. This comes as ethics standards concerning financial disclosures of the Supreme Court justices have come under scrutiny, namely conservative justices Clarence Thomas and Neil Gorsuch. So now we have it on both sides here, this debate. Um, so I, I'll, I'll start off by saying um, we don't know which way Sotomayor actually voted uh, in because those kinds of votes are not actually released. This is a decline of cert, mm -hmm. right? So um, there's no way to know whether she actually voted in favor of Penguin Random House, right? So um, in that, that, I just want to make sure that that's clear. That being said, this is much more direct than some of the things that have been floated about Justice Thomas, about, um, and they also had a hit piece on um, Justice Roberts about his wife, right? These, these are very, very attenuated interests that had anything to do with the court. This is directly the same company. And in fact, Justice Breyer had recused himself um, because his, I think his wife and he both were getting some money from a book deal with this same company. And he actually recused himself in a couple of cases regarding them. So clearly there was some kind of standard there. Justice Thomas has been involved in multiple cases, one of which we definitely know where he was the lone dissenting voice and was somebody who also took money from said company. So I don't want to say that this is more egregious than what we saw there. But I do think that this speaks to a bigger issue in, um, in our society where the Supreme Court and their justices have gone unchecked as it relates to not only symbolisms of imp impropriety, but also in, in investigations, possible recusements, and essentially um, repercussion for not recusing in situations where there could have been uh, th there could have been legal sway towards the opinions or towards the actions that they did based on receiving gifts based on receiving money based on receiving trips or you know student tuition and other things and in, in, in regards to what we've seen with with um, with several justices at, at this point particularly looking at some of the current things we see in news there's a frustration I have here because um, as someone who's worked in state and local government there is a very 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 thin line, very, very thin. You have an understanding when you sign on to these jobs and when you take those offices that you cannot take money, you cannot take trips, you cannot do these things without, quite frankly, in many cases, going to prison. Um, here, obviously, these are not elected officials. However, they are still operating on behalf of our judicial system. They're operating in a government function. There is a, there should be some level of punishment for, reprimand for, or something in place that not only codifies what behavior you can do versus what you can't, but also what the next steps are should you get caught up in things like this. So they do have recusal standards, but I think it's important to, to note um, this is a separate branch of government, right? So for example, the attempt by Congress to put in place ethics rules for the Supreme Court, that that is as absurd as the presidency coming in and telling, for example, the House what the House rules should be, right? This is, this is a totally separate and independent branch of government. That being said, right, this is the problem when um, you have the judicial branch, which is supposed to be at some remove from politics politics, right? Um, this, the, for the last 50 to 70 years, depending on, on uh, where you want to start that, I would start it for sure in 1973, but actually long before then, just the Warren court, you have, um, you have the court weighing in on issues that were once left to the American people in the states or in their, repre their representatives in Congress. They have been playing in politics now for decades. Um, and that being said, so I think, I think it's fair to expect some more rigorous disclosures. But I just don't think Congress has the right to tell tell the entirely independent well, branch how they ought to Congress, do that. That's not up to them. If it's not Congress, whom should it be would be my question, because clearly they cannot regulate themselves. We see day after day another slew of things come out as it relates to um, as it relates to this branch, specifically Clarence Thomas and Jenny Thomas, um, and the clearing of favor that came from these two. How do we regulate this type of behavior if it's, again, if it's not Congress, who should it be? Because it certainly can't be Supreme Court justices themselves.
Well, I, I, I don't think there's any way around it unless you want to completely make uh, unless the branch an, not an independent. independent. They have, they have to be able to set those But those could there be a independent oversight here? Because, no, because nobody's that's actually going worse to police than Congress. themselves. Are you kidding me? You want to appoint police officers don't bureaucrats police themselves. to oversee the court? I police mean, officers cannot police themselves. Like we, we, we know what happens when you don't have an entity that is able to regulate by design and create checks for certain non non beneficial non positive behavior. So, so the police department is accountable usually and some municipal arrangements are different but usually accountable to the mayor and the mayor has to stand for election right then selects the police commissioner right there is a line of accountability to the American people. This is a totally separate branch. The line of accountability uh, to the American people of the people who are appointed to the Supreme Court or any of the lower courts right runs through the confirmation process and in very extreme cases impeachment. That is their only remedy. OK, and I, I think it would be a massive mistake. First of all, I don't agree with your characterization of, of Thomas and or the Gorsuch stories at all. I think actually they're, they're very innocent. Um, this is you're, literally you're, a guy you're, who you're, has friends. And are, are you really white. calling this innocent when flights are paid for, when he literally was the lone dissenting voice on a on a case in which he received several hundreds of thousands of dollars for the from the organization that Justice beforehand. Thomas is changing is he, his, the idea that Justice Thomas is changing his long-held philosophy on the court because he had a friend no, who it doesn't matter in the his, burden it doesn't matter whether his somebody that they took into their family. As much as, as it does that he took that much money and then is associated with this case. He should have recused himself. Well, again, you're back to recusal standards, right? So, unfortunately, it is up to the court to set the recusal standards. There are ethics, you know, sort of standards and standards of professionalization in the legal profession as well as specifically for the court. Now, they have those standards, and but at the end of the day, those justices are the ones who decide whether or not they recuse. Just like in this case with Sotomayor, okay, she decided not to recuse herself. Again, we do not know which way she even voted on these cert petitions, right? So no, we, well, that's which is why I, I'm not using this as an example. We absolutely know where um, Justice Thomas was, how he, what he supported, and what he said in his statements, I, so and the allegiance and the relationship he had, and the monies he received. I, I, I think you're mischaracterizing that. But even let's take take a step back and talk about. Um, I, I'm fine with more disclosure or the public demanding more disclosure from the court. I think it would help in terms of, of the court's legitimacy if they were to disclose in, in some kind of even-handed manner more. I think that's completely fine. I think I'm, I'm in favor of more information to the American people, not less information to the American people. That being said, this is a separate branch, and I think you'd have to be blind not to see that this slew of investigations, which now we can see because The Daily Wire did this investigation, Luke Rosiak, a great reporter, um, did this investigation, we can see that actually what, whatever is going on with the court, this is actually it's quite systemic. common. It and is so, systemic. But my argument wasn't that it is just happening from uh, from the judges who have been appointed by conservatives. It's happening on the for, from those who've been appointed by uh, more liberal leaning or more moderate presidents as well. The issue here is that it is happening. It's not who it's happening with. The purpose, and there are the no reason checks. we are reading about this now and not, for example, in 2013 when one of these cases happened, or 20, I think 19 was the second one. The reason we are re re reading about this case right now about Sotomayor Mayor is because uh, there is a concerted effort to now scrutinize these things in order to delegitimize the court. Now, I'm all in favor, generally, of delegitimizing institutions that have lost the American people's trust. The court actually hasn't uh, lost as much trust as other institutions. Um, I think it would be a further slide, and I think generally the largest problem in our, our uh, sort of po politics right now is that institutions have not been worthy of trust. And it, oftentimes we, we flip that around and we say, oh, it's, it, it's because because Americans are, are um, having watches spun before, before their eyes. They're following conspiracy theories, disinformation, right? Um, when in reality, the legacy, for example, legacy outlets um, in the media, uh, in, in the FBI that we had a conversation about, right? Um, these institutions have repeatedly proven themselves not worthy of trust. That being said, it's extremely important. This, this one is a big one. To, to undermine the legitimacy of the court, I think, is a setup uh, to then ignore Supreme Court decisions, ignore enforcement of Supreme Court decisions, or to pack the court. I think that's pretty clearly where we're going here. I think that would be a further collapse uh, that American society, I don't think, 
I, I hope we don't get there. I think we're holding people accountable, and accountability is obviously something that is very important to our institutions, to the strength of our institutions, to the importance of our institutions. And to a point you made earlier, I think that there is a reason why the Daily Wire did not include um, how so Justice Sotomayor actually ruled here or what her commentary was. Well, there's because no way to know. The quite frankly, really information. again, like there is, they were trying to level set or match something that was a clear impropriety with what we just saw with Clarence Thomas and the long list of things that we've seen with Clarence Thomas over the years. And quite frankly, there does need to be that, a check on the system Google, and the Google behavior. That press article was, was a bunch of smoke and mirrors with weird words jammed in and implications jammed in. Well, the checks were I, cashed. I I, the so checks were cashed and the man the got reason the Daily out. Wire so. did not The reason the Daily Wire did not report this is because it's not reportable. The court doesn't release it. That's why I wanted to be clear up front about that, right? Um, there, we don't know how she voted on this because the court does not release that information. It's not because the Daily Wire left it out. It's not because Luke Rosiak left that information out in an attempt to obscure something. It's just not information the court released. Well, what we do have is that checks were cashed, tuition was paid, man made bank, and his wife made bank as well in the case of Justice Clarence Thomas. So if we want to go into the case of Justice Clarence Thomas, this tuition was for a kid who had come into his family in, in bad circumstances. He was a nephew. He was, not, uh, he was not required, by the way, by any of those disclosure forms to report, report anything about his nephew because it lists certain family members you're supposed to report on. It does not list that relation very specifically. And I think that this is actually a bunch of, of uh, like I said, implications jammed in. What the reality is that uh, this was a kid who came into the Clarence Thomas family, uh, that Thomases took him in, and that there he had a friend who offered to pay tuition for their child. To okay, carry they're, favor they're, for the things that he wanted. No, I, Nobody's well, out here just giving free no, tuition payments out these to kids. Two have, like, that's by the way, not Harlan a thing. Crow, and if that was happening, it would be great. We would have a lot of people who way, didn't have student loan debt. But that's not what's happening way to here. the left of Clarence Thomas on judicial issues. Okay, So the idea that he was influencing Clarence Thomas's decisions just doesn't make any sense. Claire, like Harlan Crow is a moderate GOP donor. He also donates to the Democratic Party. Okay, And he's he's come out and, and explained his relationship. They are personal friends. He has an enormous interest in history, this guy. That's why he collects all kinds he of weird stuff in his house. And, and that's why he bought the Thomas's, Thomas. the Thomas's house um, in order to preserve it and to make it into a museum. This is very much in keeping with what this guy has done with his money, which I frankly think is pretty cool. If you have a lot of money, I think this is like one of the cooler things you can do with your money is preserve history. Um, but there is, is no, it, it doesn't make any sense that Clarence Thomas's rulings, which are far, far to the conservative side of any of Harlan Crow's beliefs. By the way, the guy is pro-choice. Right, so just start there. Like the idea that Clarence Thomas and his long-held judicial beliefs and his judicial philosophy is guided by the fact that he has a friend who happens to be very wealthy. I think that's ridiculous. To bring along I, I several, just, I, several other conservatives and alt-right leaders on these trips as well, who are a part of the conversation with Clarence Thomas when he goes on these specific trips. I, I think that you're trying to nullify something that is a much bigger get and a much more pertinent conversation, because quite frankly, there is obvious support for Clarence Thomas, which fine, you support his ideology and the things that he makes, that, that is absolutely well, I fine. Think, I think However, he's one of the greatest living, the, living Americans. Well. That, again, that, that's your yeah. opinion. But we do have evidence to show the payments that went the payments that went in his direction, the people who were actually on these trips who also create paper, who had reason to be in those rooms with him and try to sway things. This is not something that should be swept under the rug or diminished in any way. Look, if, if that's the standard, then literally every single conference, for example, of the American Constitution Society, which is the corresponding organization on the left to the Federalist Society, right, it comes under scrutiny. They're, they're, the legal profession until now, and especially um, in, the judicial, in the judiciary, has had a certain amount of collegiality. They have governed their own recusal. Rules. Now, if we want to move into an era where the court is explicitly political and we want to put pressure on them to disclose more of these things, I actually, you know, I think that's okay. Like I said, I'm in favor of more information, not less. But let's not rewrite history. Thomas, Thomas did not have to disclose any of this stuff. He, there was no obligation for him to do so. He may have to amend one form, but by the way, no other justice has ever um, used this this uh, sort of amendment form that he used. No other justice has ever disclosed, and I guarantee you they've sold their house, they've done, right? So like, there was a certain amount of collegiality in this branch. If that's over, fine. Maybe it's, it, it, maybe it's appropriate that it be over, given the deep divisions in this country and the deep divisions on the court. Um, and, and again, I don't mind if, if they disclose more. That being said, they're still an independent branch, and I think it's very, very dangerous uh, to, to have Congress or the president interfere with that branch. If Congress wants to do something about this, they have one and only one remedy. They can bring impeachment hearings. That is their only constitutional remedy to be able to tell the court what to do. They cannot mess with the recusal rules. It would be just as inappropriate as if the court came into the House and said, this is how you put a bill on the floor.
Like I said, All right. then we need a change in the system. Yeah, sorry. Unfortunately, we have to wrap up this heated discussion. More rising after this.